Do you ever get the feeling that nations, borders, and flags are completely meaningless? If the elites control everything, then who wins when the major global powers go to war? The truth is that no one wins, except the ones who are rich and powerful enough to seize the spoils of war when the dust settles. The poor, working class population of this planet are the clear losers every single time we go to war. But if you're part of the inner circle, then it doesn't really matter whose side you're on. When these wars end, you might find yourself enjoying exactly the same powers and freedoms, even if you committed war crimes for the losing side. Operation Paperclip is a clear example of this. After World War II came to an end, full-on Nazis were eagerly embraced by the United States and quickly put to work on various projects. They never experienced consequences for what they did. Why? Because they were valuable. They were intelligent. They had too much to offer. The United States government knew that some of these Nazis were among the most intelligent people on the planet, and instead of executing them like so many other party members, they found a better use for them. They set these former Nazis to work on building rockets for NASA synthesizing new chemicals, and creating advanced weapons for the U.S. Army. But what exactly happened during this strange and controversial post-war period? What did Operation Paperclip scientists create for the United States? What were some of their war crimes during the war? And why did we even allow it to happen? Let's find out. First of all, it's important to understand just how advanced Nazi Germany was prior to the end of the war. As the situation became more and more desperate for Hitler, he started to become increasingly reliant on so-called superweapons, also known in Germany as Wunderwaff. These included incredible vehicles, such as super-heavy tanks, helicopters, missiles, and much more. During this time, Germany pioneered many new technologies, including the first jet-powered airplanes and the first assault rifles. And that's only what we know about. Germany may have been experimenting with all kinds of additional technologies that were never made public. Things like UFOs, energy weapons, and even spacecraft. Some have argued that if Germany had focused on mass production, rather than trying to create these wonder weapons, they might have been able to win the war. In contrast to the Nazis, American military leaders focused on mass-producing reliable weapons like the Sherman tank. This strategy eventually proved to be extremely effective. Hitler was desperately trying to develop a superweapon that would turn the war in his favor, even when all hope was lost. The United States simply picked up where he left off and continued the research. The United States may have had many reasons for creating Operation Paperclip. First, they were still fighting a war against Japan when Germany fell. They needed access to some of the most advanced weapons on the planet. This logic ultimately proved to be correct, as Japan was only brought to its knees after we unleashed the power of the atomic bomb, a highly experimental new weapon at the time. The United States were looking for anything that could quickly and decisively end the war with Japan. In addition, the Americans wanted to prevent the Germans from rising up again. Leaving their most innovative scientists in the fatherland might have allowed them to return to power relatively quickly, especially if these scientists were allowed to continue working on many of the wonder weapons developed during the war. But perhaps the most important reason for the creation of Operation Paperclip was also the most obvious. 
the United States simply wanted to strengthen themselves after the war to the greatest extent possible. And you know what they say, knowledge is power. Overall, the United States accepted more than 700 Nazi scientists into the nation, including their family members. There's obviously far too many to list here, but here are a few notable names you should be aware of. Werner von Braun is one of the most well-known products of Operation Paperclip, and clearly one of its most successful. This German rocket scientist played a vital role in NASA's rise to prominence. He is often described in history books as the father of space travel. In the years after the fall of the Third Reich, von Braun was quickly Americanized, his past in the Nazi regime largely forgotten. But there is no denying that this scientist was working closely with Hitler's Germany during the war. Among other things, he co-developed the infamous V-2 rocket. This rocket was one of the first guided ballistic missiles in history, and it was capable of traveling at supersonic speed and was completely unstoppable. It killed about 9,000 civilians and a further 12,000 people died in forced labor camp during its production. The V-2 rocket was also the first human-built object to reach outer space. The official story is that Von Braun was aware that slaves were being used to create the V-2 rockets, but he found this to be repulsive. Some prisoners claim that Von Braun personally ordered prisoners to be punished, although these reports have never been confirmed. Despite the fact that he was a full member of the Nazi party, Von Braun went on to become a beloved figure in the United States, helping NASA win the space race and even working with Disney to develop a number of children's films. Von Braun also joined the SS, one of the most brutal paramilitary groups in human history. There was also Herbert A. Wagner, an Australian scientist known for his work on fluid dynamics and unsteady lift. During the war, his glide bombs killed thousands of people. He then helped the US Navy develop guided missiles before starting his own consulting firm in the United States. I have heard this misquoted right often. We uh, just uh, were working on rockets and guided missiles, and only privately uh, we talked in the evening about space flight. There was Professor Obert even in Peenemünde. So we talked quite a bit about space flight, but officially in Peenemünde we did not work on space flight. And our future uh, projects office, where Ludwig Groth was mm -hmm. on, for instance, mm -hmm worked on longer range guided missiles, on anti-aircraft guided missiles and this type of things, but um, there was not a single man working really only on space flight. Eberhard Ries helped von Braun develop the V-2 rocket, and he was also brought into the Apollo program after the war. Ries was instrumental in developing the ablative heat shield, which protected astronauts re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Hans K. Ziegler, another German who was active during World War II, helped pioneer some of the first satellites, including those used for communication. He was also one of the first people to develop solar panels, which proved instrumental in providing power to satellites. Siegfried Niemeyer was an aeronautical engineer at the head of technical development at the Reich Ministry of Aviation during the war. He once suggested that the Germans drop a radioactive dirty bomb on New York City. Niemeyer was also accepted into the United States as part of Operation Paperclip and eventually received the Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Award. Adolf Busemann was a highly influential German aerospace engineer who specialized in supersonic airflows. He is most famous for inventing the concept of swept wings a feature that is present on virtually every modern aircraft today. He was also brought into the United States as a part of Operation Paperclip. George Rickey oversaw the production of the V-1 and V-2 rockets during the war and was awarded the Knight's Cross along with Werner von Braun. 
he was eventually accused of working closely with the SS and Gestapo, with some even claiming that he personally witnessed executions. He was brought to the United States to work at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Herbertus Strughold was one of the most controversial figures in Operation Paperclip. Known as the father of space medicine, it was later alleged that he had participated in human experiments during the Nazi regime. Some claim that Strughold was involved in a number of horrific human experiments, including inmates being frozen to death and operated on without anesthetic. However, his connection to these experiments was never proven. After arriving in the United States, Strughold helped develop pressure suits and life support systems that proved vital during the Apollo missions. Kurt H. Debus was another German scientist who was closely involved in the V2 program along with Von Braun. Debus eventually became the first director of NASA's Launch Operations Center, later renamed the Kennedy Space Center. There's also the case of Otto Ambrose. Although he was technically never part of Operation Paperclip, he nonetheless went on to play a vital role in the post-war US economy. A convicted war criminal, Ambrose created nerve agents like sarin gas for the Nazis. He also participated in slave labor during the war. However, Otto also helped create synthetic rubber, which led the US to grant him clemency after his release from prison in 1951. He ultimately went on to work closely with various chemical companies in the United States, such as Dow Chemical and the US Army Chemical Corps. When you understand the full scale of Operation Paperclip, NASA begins to look more like a Nazi organization than an American one. These scientists eventually reached positions of considerable influence in the organization, and some even became directors. It's strange to think that some American war veterans might have returned home to work for NASA, only to discover that their new boss was a former Nazi. It's also worth mentioning that the golden age of space exploration occurred while these Nazi scientists were running the show at NASA. Some argue that NASA has diminished considerably since the passing of these scientists. After all, we haven't attempted to return to the moon since the alleged Apollo missions, and those occurred many decades ago. Why does NASA seem to be less advanced today than it was during the era of Von Braun? Why are we now dependent on Russian rockets to reach the space station? Without these Nazi scientists, is NASA just a shell of its former self? It's definitely a question worth asking. Operation Paperclip speaks volumes about how the most powerful people on the planet view major world conflicts. Throughout World War II, the Nazis were demonized as sadistic, genocidal maniacs. We needed to stop them at all costs. We needed to bring them to justice. But when the war ended, some of these war criminals were simply brought to the United States without any fuss whatsoever. Suddenly, it was as if Nazi war crimes didn't even matter anymore. As long as you had something of value to offer the United States, you literally get away with murder. What does that say about our morality as a nation? Was World War II really about bringing war criminals to justice, or did the United States view this as an opportunity? Was World War II simply about grabbing power, resources, and some of the brightest minds on the planet? Did we really care about the fact that the Nazis had committed such terrible atrocities? Judging by Operation Paperclip, the answer seems to be no.